Our host today is Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer at Suzy. Katie, take it away. Thank you so much. Thank you everybody for joining us for this fireside chat. This discussion today is designed to be one of the most informative and action-oriented conversations that you'll attend. As mentioned, I'm Katie Gross, Chief Customer Officer at real-time market research platform Suzy. And we partner with hundreds of the world's top brands, helping them identify more agile ways to tap consumers for both qualitative and quantitative insights that will drive their business decisions. So today we're conducting this fireside chat to dig into how some of the leading insight leaders um, are navigating 2021 and preparing for a year of further uncertainty. Fran has been a user of Suzy now for a number of years and has seen our product and panel evolve over that time. And I'll allow Fran to introduce himself and give you all his background. So over to you, Fran. Awesome. Thanks, Katie. Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon, I guess, depending on where you're at. Um, yeah, like Katie mentioned, uh, my name is uh, Fran Guzman. I am the lead of Insights and Strategy at uh, Craft Times, where I am over our, what you could basically call our healthy snacking and hydration uh, portfolios. Um, so a lot of the work there, right, as you can imagine, full service Insights and Strategy team supporting innovation, brand category management, uh, strategic planning, customer development, et cetera, right? Really much um, general support and growth strategy for, for the portfolios um, that are under management. Um, prior to that, I, I had similar roles at, at Sonic Drive-In, um, QSR Place, and also Dr. Pepper, um, before they were here at Dr. Pepper. And then also did uh, three years in consulting. So I've um, been in the space for about 10 years and excited to see how um, these tools have been evolving <laughs> in my time in the space. So I've enjoyed it jump in. Awesome. Thanks for joining us today. What a background. So Fran, right now at Suzy, we're predicting that it's going to be yet another year of being almost completely socially distant. How's Kraft Heinz seeing this right now? Yeah, I mean, and from a research perspective, right, if you think about it, when, when March happened, um, I would say it was a moratorium on just anything and everything. Um, sentiment from consumer was all over the place. Um, you know, the, the uncertainty is just a, a lot of going on that, that would not make a lot of research actionable or, or favorable for us at that time, right? Um, so up front, uh, at the beginning, it was very much a moratorium on it. And then it kind of blew up in terms of saying, how do we get creative, innovative, um, knowing that we can't be in person, knowing that we have all these limitations because of COVID. Um, and that sparked a lot of the possibility of being able to go into new things and, and try out aspects of it, right? The biggest the biggest adoption to date being the, the comfort that comes with online qual um, versus in-person qual, right? Which has been the standard and industry norm um, at the end of the day. Yeah, absolutely. And we'll definitely come on to that in a second uh, and really do a deep dive into there. Um, before we get there though, I know that a number of our CPG and food and beverage clients right now are reorganizing themselves for 2021. Um, a lot of them are moving away from kind of category and brand teams and more into occasion-based teams. Could you tell me a little bit more about how Kraft Heinz is addressing this and what your thoughts are on that type of organization setup? Yeah, um, I actually have the great distinction of joining Kraft Heinz the same day that the new CEO started. Um, so it was a, a very interesting component of it, right? Because with it, you know, to that end came a, a reorg aspect of it that, that we all knew and we were all expecting. Um, that was set to go live in March. Um, as you can imagine, <laughs> things uh, things got shifted and, and reprioritized, right? But the biggest thing, it, it was that even COVID didn't necessarily change the approach. And, and if you've listened to our investor day or seen kind of the coverage that Kraft Heinz got as we rolled this out, um, our focus is moving away from, from categories in terms of saying the snack nut category, you know, versus the yogurt category and really focus on, on consumer platforms in terms of how, how consumers shop, right? So, so we look at this as a healthy snacking component and healthy beverages versus, you know, cookies versus crackers type of thing, um, which is a very big shift in the industry because as you can imagine, um, so much of this work is really much focused on the categories that we play in. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, and so, so I guess, you know, we're thinking about the way that consumers consume and the way that shoppers shop, it's now kind of changed so much. Could you talk to me a little bit more about kind of thinking about the frame of reference from the shopper perspective and how they might be different from the consumer today? Exactly, right? So that's the, the big unlock for us. As sticking to our healthy snacking example, right? A consumer doesn't go into the store and saying, I'm going into this aisle and buying this product. 
a lot of the time for for snacking occasions, it's a, it's a identify it through the grocery store when you're going through that aspect. So the shopper experience is very much focused holistically on the frame of reference and everything that's available at the grocery versus the aisles that we're at, right? So a lot of our work has to focus on, to your point, the jobs to be done and, and the occasion, but it's no longer even just snacking. It's this food can serve and help with this aspect when you want something that's healthy, right? Which is at the end of the day, the, the focus of the consumer platform, a healthy snack. Yeah. So I guess you're focused more on winning the winning at the occasion level rather than winning at the brand's level per se. Correct. Right. Um, you want to be considered a real food healthy snack, not a nut snack. Type of thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Interesting. Um, and so how does that impact the shopper research that you've, you've done and how has that kind of evolved your, the, your, your support of your retail partners? Yeah. Right. A lot of our research has focused on understanding uh, how our customers, consumers shop, right? There are end users, but for our customers are the retailers and being able to provide them with a lot of insights of how their shoppers um, look at the category, right? Understanding and diving into throwing it out there. You, you shop at Walmart versus Publix for your groceries, right? There's gonna be nuances on, on what healthy snacking looks like as a portfolio, nuances on what products fit into that uh, bucket for you as a retailer. So our focus has really been on as much hyper-personalized, hyper-regionalized data that we can get our hands on to translate into insights, right? Which is where, you know, the, the big ask comes from. We want things that are fast, actionable, and localized and, and personalized as much as possible. And we want it yesterday, right? As a industry normal. Yep, yep, definitely a lot of requests for uh, deadlines of yesterday, for sure, in the industry at the moment. Yeah. Um, so as this kind of second wave is hitting the country right now, um, and of course we're also kind of compounded with a shift in, in government also, how has that shifted your learning plans and your research plans for 2021, if indeed you're even kind of finalized on learning plans for 2021? What does that start to look like? Yeah, I will tell you that the learning plans are, are fluid at best, given if you compare to previous times where we've been, you know, where we have a general sense of what, what's happening and what we're going to be doing with brands. It's definitely more fluid as, as a result of COVID. Um, what I would say, you know, as you all may know, traditional CPG manufacturers have ended up finding and identifying a lot of growth that's come because of a result of COVID, right? The macro trends of not having competitions away from home, people are just going back, right? And I can tell you, I myself have not eaten Kraft mac and cheese for a while, but COVID happened and I definitely stocked up on it because it's nostalgia, childhood food, um, and the other aspect that consumers are very much focused on trusted heritage brands, right? So the fact that Planters is 100 years old, that Kraft Mac and Cheese is a certain age and has that experience has been very helpful. So for us, our focus has been, we know that we've grown, right? How do we isolate, identify, and understand how to keep that relationship with consumers, right? Not transactional, but how do you elevate it? And someone like myself didn't buy Kraft Mac and Cheese before. How do you keep me in in that household penetration loop without kids, right, which is the driving factor for having that brand in your house. Yeah, and is that uh, kind of the, the growth, the, I guess the dr growth, growth drivers, you have to do a lot of research to really uh, kind of understand the growth. Um, it's obviously great to kind of rise on a rising tide, but understanding really what's driving it to maintain it. Is that been a focus of your research? Correct, right. At the end of the day, as, as you can imagine, when it comes to understanding growth, it's very much anchored on, on panel data and you have certain metrics, household penetration, buyer, like the standard business models. But a lot of our focus is still on understanding the why, right? We need to dive into what, why did that household penetration go up during that time frame? And that's where the qual work comes in and a lot of the quick hit deep dives, right, that we're able to do with, with quick turnaround survey aspects of it. So yes, at the analytical level, we'll have a framework to deconstruct that growth, but the big question is still gonna be why, right? And how we dive into that. If it's buy rate among heavy buyers, well, why did they, you know, was it just a shelving exercise? If that's the case, how much action is there that we can take to keep them, right, as, as a consumer? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So um, I know as you look into 2021, you've mentioned to me looking at non-restrictive toolkits and having that kind of need for, for agile um, and mixed methodologies. So we'll get into some details there. First question though, has it been fun to test out and start to look at some of the newer tools in the market research industry? I would say that that's probably been one of the silver linings from 2020, our openness to 
you know, throw something against the wall to see and test and try it and break it a little bit, right? Um, and it's been somewhat encouraged. So a lot of the tools that we're seeing of going online and the platform and even the product optimizations that happened during the COVID timeframe, right, of what customers were needing, um, it was fun to play with and, and try out. Yeah. I know we've talked a little bit about the, the kind of the rigidness of market research has been lifted out of the way. Um, you yourself kind of came from the polling industry. Could you maybe share some of the kind of learnings and from your life as a pollster and how that kind of rigidity has potentially led to some of their uh, PR issues, I guess, um, today and how you, you've seen kind of market research kind of learn from that? Yeah, uh, at the end of the day, getting a strong echo, you know, maybe go on mute. Um, when it comes to a lot of the polling industry, right, at the end of the day, um, it's anchored on your sample, right? Like who you're talking to about likely voters and how how they're going to turn out in that election. Um, and you live and die by that sample component of it, right? Um, that's your, your framework and that's where you're tracking along the entire way. Um, and I would argue that the past two elections have really put a question mark on how good is research at predicting outcomes. Right. Um, the modification that I, I tell people when we're coming to market research, right, it's also the evolution of market research. Um, for us, uh, I would argue that a lot of the learnings and the teachings were very much focused on the purpose of market research is to mitigate risk. I would argue that that evolution has, you know, which is similar to what polling is for. Like, let me help you predict what's going to happen. I'm mitigating the risk in your investment, et cetera. Um, what we're trying to predict is not necessarily the behavior aspect of it, but we're trying to be proactive of the desire and the want and the need, right? There's not going to be one set answer on, on what we're, we're delivering on. It's going to be a predictive aspect on wants, needs, and desires versus saying this is going to happen, they're going to buy this product, and they're going to move to this type of thing. So the purpose and the end focus um, is what's changing, and it's, it's very different also to the polling space. Yeah, awesome. All right, so let's focus specifically on qualitative market research now. So at Suzy, we just launched this year uh, Suzy Live, which is digital IDIs connected to our quant capabilities, and it's been wildly successful um, so far. So let's focus on online qual. What doors, kind of virtual doors, has virtual qualitative research really opened up for, for you guys at Craft Times? Yeah, look, I would say the, the lowest hanging fruit has been in the communication space in being able to pressure test ideas among consumers that we know are end target um, and being able to get that feedback along the way as we finalize a lot of not only our strategy but communication hierarchy and anything that goes tied to that right mm -hmm. yeah yeah it's almost like covid and and the lockdown has kind of forced a mandatory acceptance of online qual. I know before you you kind of mentioned that you were always flying to Dallas and New York and that face-to-face -face was kind of deemed to be better. Um, but certainly I think that the, the mandatory acceptance of online qual is gonna help us again, speed up those time, that time to insights and, and get results yesterday <laughs> as everyone needs. Have there been any benefits to seeing consumers in their natural environment instead of in a um, kind of a, a facility as it were? I mean, I would argue that there has there's a movement away from just such a rigid approach to market research to get better insights right for consumers or, or more natural insights from them um and i believe that that helps right there's a comfort of being in your home and and communicating about your food and beverage uh, consumption for example so definitely a plus and i think it's also people are just more willing to, to talk and, and they're freer to do it versus when they're in the back of, you know, there's a, a room and, and a glass and there's people behind you and whatnot. They're definitely um, aware of uh, of that two-way glass as much as they, they know they're being watched. Um, have discussion guides changed as well? Have you had to kind of rewrite discussion guides to deal with the kind of virtual um, IDI rather than face-to-face? Uh, yeah, I would yeah, say that would we've say actually that moved them to be less rigid, um, which is to the benefit of it, right? So we're very much focused on talk to me about the snacking occasion versus hitting specific points that a lot of the time we anchor on strategy, right? Of like, we want to understand that the job to be done is right, that the brand ethos is right. At the end of the day, we're just saying, 
what talk to us about this occasion, right? And I'll give you a, a big aha that has allowed for, for a lot of that thing, right? When we're looking at unstructured research, we were really understanding this snacking occasion, right? And, and I was telling some people on my team yesterday that I'm, I'm willing to put a bet on this to see, see if it actually pans out. But this notion of snacking, I think, is really going away. I, I would argue that in 10 years, we're not going to be talking about a snacking portfolio. Gen Z and under is very much, in general, a grazing society. Snacking was, was uh, a solution to the in-between meals and giving it a name. We've now moved away from that. There's no such thing as breakfast time because everyone has, you know, work from home. Like everything has gone up and, and changed around. So there's no more snacking. And the, the feedback was like they eat when they eat and if it needs to be a meal replacement or a hold me over, they choose based on, on the food that they're consuming, right? And I think that's a big aha to understand where we're going and, and what's next, right? Snacking might not be a portfolio because that's not how consumers are looking at eating potentially down the future. Granted, that's, that's a bet that I'm saying and, and, and prediction that I'm trying to put out there, but that's some of the insights that we're able to get because it's less restrictive. Um, and it's qual one on one, right? And, and IDIs, and then you have to go and turn around and quantify that to, to justify any movement. But that's where those nuggets of insights really come from. Yeah, I would 100% agree. If you if you looked at, I guess, any of your participants' desks, they're probably just covered in snack wrappers. <laughs> um, that grazing aspect of the consumer's kind of habits today, I think, is com completely true. So I'd be uh, on your side of that bet also that it's it's less around three meals with a snack at 3 p.m. You know, especially when you are office based, it's a good excuse just to kind of leave the office for 10 minutes. It's like I'm gonna go get a snack at 3 p.m. That no longer exists. Um, so I'd be interested to see, the, see how that evolves um, over time also. Have you found that with, um, with uh, doing a qualitative online and with people being in their homes, have you had to be kind of more sympathetic or empathetic to the realities of their lives um, around them? I can imagine dogs and kids kind of getting in the way of, well, not getting in the way, but being in the background of a lot of those um, virtual IDIs. Um, has that kind of changed the way that you are kind of empathizing with consumers? Yes, right, in terms of the norm, right, of moving forward. But I would argue that it's actually led to more engaged consumers because it's almost an escape from them <laughs> during this COVID timeframe. So we've had people really like the level of conversation that's viable has been, I believe, stronger and richer than when we are in person. I, I would argue that COVID definitely has accelerated that because consumers don't have anything, right? Like this is their escape from having to be at home the entire time. Um, but the richness has come through because of it. So while we're more empathetic, right, what we're seeing is that consumers are eager to talk about anything other than, you know, COVID, the economy, like things that are happening with them that, and then the food and beverage space is something that, you know, everyone has an opinion, everyone has to eat and, and consume. So it, it really has seen almost as an escape. And, and I would be interested to see how much of that enthusiasm, you know, comes or, or stays post COVID uh, vaccines and then post COVID world, right? Yeah, it almost sounds like um, the, 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 the virtual kind of qualitative uh, world was a fix um, to not being able to do face to face, but maybe it's actually, if it's giving you richer insights, it probably will be a trend that actually stays way beyond um, social distancing. Is there anything that you're missing, however, such as, you know, seeing that kind of body language, if you're only seeing kind of people's shoulders and above, are you missing any body language aspects of, um, of face to face? You know, to be honest, it's really more about things like packaging research right like that uh, as we look at brands needing to renovate their packaging uh, across the board to stay relevant um it's really hard to think of how do you do that online there there's a lot of limitations to to some things that need to be done in the food space right like we do things like clts for, for our product to not only go through the quality standardization aspects that are required as a manufacturer of food in this country right but also in terms of the feedback that we're getting um of it so the harder part is when we're looking at things that need to be done, such as packaging, which is something that requires consumers touching it and seeing how they really interact with it. Um, same thing, right, with um, being able to do something like CLTs and product testing. Um, yes, there's IHUT and a lot of ways that we're looking at that and how we, how we go about it. But at the end of the day, it's better to have everyone come to a central location testing, try the product, and we can have that information and, and move on versus the logistics of an I had, right? But you, you got to work with what you have in, in a 2020 Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to ask more specifically about around kind of CLTs and and IHUTs and um, obviously the kind of 
Spacey's S kind of benchmarks, how are you really addressing um, those two things? And are you kind of replacing central location testing with IHUTs right now? Do you think they'll stick at the end of this um, uh, socially distant world we're living in? Yeah, I would argue that because of what's happening and the reality of that, that we are, to my enjoyment, and, and I think that's what research should be moving to, we're moving away from a lot of confirmatory research, right? And what does that mean? It's like, this product is what we're going to launch, confirm that it meets the standards that we've set as a benchmark, and more towards having research be, be guidance for, for what we need to do. Um, an example of that, right? We can't necessarily do a Stacey's home product testing, whatever it is, product testing to the level that we've done in the past. What we're doing is as we're doing these formulations, as we're doing these product modifications, how do we get consumer feedback in the process of that development, right? Maybe they automatically kill a flavor for us because they're like, this is the worst thing that you guys have produced. There's no need for us to continue doing X, Y, Z. Or it could be like, hey, we're already thinking that this is going to be our lowest performing skew because these flavors aren't out there but we hear consumers saying this is the best tasting out of all of them, right? Like it helps modify and improve along the way versus confirmatory, which is where a lot of the CLTs of the world were landing, right? Um, so I would argue that that's been one of the big benefits um, as we move away from that capability or ability at the moment. Yeah, you raise a, um, a really good point about a confirmatory kind of validation research into iteration and co-creation. Um, which is a lot, what a lot of our clients are doing right now. It's much more about kind of like evolving concept ideas over time rather than testing kind of further down the line um, concepts, as it were. I'd love if you could talk a little bit more about kind of what kind of innovation culture does Kraft Heinz have and what kind of innovation culture do you think is most successful for a, a food and drink company in 2021? Yeah, like I, I would say our innovation culture is very... Uh, similar to in terms of large manufacturing CPG companies, right? Um, we, we focus a lot on trying to understand what um, our big ahas are. And if you look at, at kind of our heavy hitters and in innovation for Kraft Heinz, we've had a couple that really were, were, were you know, breakthroughs for us. If you look at something like Devour that really disrupted the, the frozen food category, right? Just Crack an Egg created an entire new product. So did Neo, right? An entire new category. Um, so the push is really about how do we get to those level of ideas, right? Fewer, bigger, better, incremental, uh, always being the directive. Um, but within it, we have to operate within what is a global food manufacturer, Kraft Heinz apparatus, right? And to that, there, there's a lot of the times pitfalls that just are the reality that we have to deal with that I would argue a lot of manufacturers have to do, right? There's regulatory components of vendors that you can work with and source food from that already you know, limits so much of your aspects of it. People that are allowed in our system versus others that can do X, Y, Z is very much tied to, to those limitations. Um, but in terms of the culture, right, it's very much encouraged and, and it's always about have a breakthrough cycle, idea, innovation, I would say on an annual basis, right? And seeing and iterating and, and trying to do it. So I would say that it pushes it and it encourages it and tries to find the avenues to encourage innovation for each category. Um, but it also has to operate again within the global manufacturer apparatus, which has its pitfalls um, just because of the size, right? It's harder to be nimble and to move as quickly as a small brand with one supply chain, with one vendor, with one everything. You're on mute. Sorry, issues with the muting button there. <laughs> um, so you mentioned kind of an, an innovation culture, and I saw a press release that you guys had recently on exactly to your point, fewer, bigger, better, um, et cetera. So really thinking about 2021, obviously you guys have seen a huge amount of growth in 2020. As you said, you're not having to compete with the out of home um, eating habits. It's really about the internal now. Um, what kind of pressures are you under for 2021 to kind of either continue that growth trajectory or maintain that growth trajectory? Um, and what does that mean for the Insights team in particular? Yeah, I would say our biggest directive, you know, for 21 onward has been due to the realities of what it was in the macro forces, Kraft Heinz experienced significant growth, right, in, in 2020, however what you cut it. Our initiatives moving forward is how do you keep a portion slash majority of that growth, right? And that's the that's the directive at, at the end of the day. So a lot of our research and insights is focused on that, right? 
And when it comes to innovation, also understanding what has COVID really impacted in this, right? I think the whole notion of RX food was already on trend. I think a lot of people had heard of it. I mean, the way that it was being manifested, you know, definitely there. But I think we're at a crux for a great opportunity for a global manufacturer like Kraft Heinz because because of COVID, consumers are looking for established, trusted brands, but they're also expecting more from their food, right? So they're looking for that RX food. Is it gut health? Is it sleep? Is it XYZ? It's food plus, right? It's an additional benefit. It's no longer just a way to stay alive or a nutrient that you need to to live, right? So given those two aspects coming out of 2020, right, I would say that that's probably one of the biggest opportunities for for brands like Planters and Kraft Mac and Cheese and and even Kool-Aid and Jet Puff, right, that have been in consumers' lives for 30, 40, 50 plus years. So you're a betting man. You've talked about... um grazing um, versus snacking, et cetera. Um, what are your thoughts on when the when we're kind of all said and done and the um, we have a vaccine and, and things are open again, do you think everyone's gonna rush to start eating out every night of the week? Or do you think these new cooking skills and new brands um, and those kind of like comfort areas that we have learned and those new behaviors, do you think they'll stick way beyond the kind of vaccine and, and social distancing uh, being lifted? Yeah, I mean, Definitely, I think up front, the shock period, and you can include me in that, it's going to be almost every other night going out to eat just to be able to go out and sit down, right? Kind of that initial shock from it. Um, I think some of the macro trends and data that we're seeing, though, I, I would, it's really interesting as we're seeing these, um, these Uber of the food space, right, for food service kind of emerge where it's ghost kitchens, right? We, we've heard of this from so many investors coming into this, Uber's old CEO is, is in the ghost kitchen space, really trying to do that, right? So what I actually see happening is more about at-home behavior still being very likely, but leveraging more of the takeout opportunity because it's going to be more accessible and cost-effective versus having to go pick it up and do it yourself. So it is going to be an easier occasion to get at home. So I, I do foresee that people are going to be leveraging that a lot more. Um, I think the dining out aspect of it is more of the experiential thing. So people are still going to want that at the end of the day. I think it's actually going to potentially increase the occasions for out of home food in home because it just makes it more accessible and different varieties, right? You can order from the same restaurant slash ghost kitchen and then delivers the exact same time and, and whatnot. So the availability, I think, is going to go up, but the going out is probably going to go back to where, where it was, right? And then also dependent on the economy as it's the first thing to to be cut from budget. Yeah, for sure. Could you explain for the audience more about this kind of ghost kitchen concept? I've only started to hear about it myself in the last couple of weeks, so I'd love to kind of hear your take on it and what it means um, and where that trend's going. Yeah, so I mean, the the idea is that, you know, the, the biggest cost drivers when it comes to restaurants and you look at the food service, right? Um, it was a similar issue at Sonic. Operations is you live and die by, by operations, right? In terms of not only your profitability, but being able to, deliver quality product, all, all the things that, that go into it, right? And, and part of that operation is having the, the facilities, the capabilities to execute your menu and what shape or form, right? So we've already seen some restaurants that might share the same kitchen and they're right next to each other, but one's branded as a pizza place, another branded as a salad joint, right? Um, but they're the same thing. What we're seeing is, you know, I could have a pizza brand that I developed myself because I, I am a chef and I, I love cooking pizzas. I can go to a ghost kitchen and rent it out, right? And say on this month, you know, when people order pizzas, I get the oven and I'm using it just for pizzas, right? While you could have Thai food, right? Being cooked right next and they're like, we just take the stove space and then you borrow the other stove space. So I, as a consumer, right? They're seen as different brands. You know, you develop a brand as a food brand but it's still being cooked in the same kitchen, the same ghost kitchen, right? That allows for multiple types of food going out, um, allowing for that access, right? For, for a lot of restaurants that can't afford um, the kitchens and then the things that go uh, with running a restaurant. That's awesome. Thanks for explaining the, the details there. Um, so thinking about kind of careers in market research as a whole, we've had to be very adaptive um, and resilient over the last year or so. And if anybody can hear that snoring, it is my French bulldog who is snoring right next to me. So apologies for that extra noise there. 
getting the real in-home experience for, for Katie Gross here. Um, could you talk to me a little bit more about kind of careers in market research and, and the skills that have been needed um, to have been developed this year to, and what you think will need to be developed in 2021 to continue um, us to grow as an industry? Yeah, I would say, um, you know, one of the things that we've talked a lot about, um, and interesting enough, I, I used to be involved with uh, UC Arlington's Master's in Marketing Research Program um, on their board. And one of the conversations that we always had when the curriculum aspect came up is that so many people coming out of these programs are extremely well trained in the quantitative, the, the methods, the approach, the the fundamentals and the technicals that are required really to, to be a market researcher, right? But what we're seeing is that as we are working towards moving insights from a cost center of a, 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 a tool to mitigate risk to foresight and, and a strategic partner, what we're needing is also, you know, not only the technical skills, but a way to a business mindset, right? What What is the business objective that we're trying to accomplish? How do I tell a story with the data, right? I, I The notion that we still have to distinguish between a presentation and a report, right? It is a big thing that is a struggle for a lot of the shift for a lot of people um, in the industry, right? Because it's we're, we're hammered into the technicality, the 95% confidence interval, the, the things that are required to be a good market researcher. Um, so I would argue when it comes to those career aspects of it, you see a lot of people that are great at the technical skills and that, and that gap in that bridge is really almost in that business mindset as, you know, and it depends on department by department, company by company. But that, that's probably the, the big leap, right, and the bridge that needs to occur as the industry is moving more towards that strategic business partner. Yeah, you raise a really good point. Um, I've heard the phrase a number of times this year that great insights will always die in the middle of a PowerPoint presentation. Um, and it's, yeah, it's definitely more about um, being able to sell it internally as, as a new idea or a new um, methodology, et cetera. What kind of barriers do you see um, internally um, at maybe at Kraft Heinz or in your past experience, kind of barriers to listening to the market research and seeing the data? Yeah, like I, I would say that the first aspect of it is really how the market research insights department is, is viewed, leveraged, and, and organized, right? That says a lot um, regarding the organization. Um, I would argue that a big barrier is still that so many people look at the insights, and even if it's called a market research department, as the data providers. Like, here's the data, here's the slide, right, moving forward. Um, and that's that's a big barrier of having to switch that, right? Like, I've had, for example, this week, I, I had a back and forth with someone who had access to the data, who could go in and pull it themselves. They've done it multiple times. But the ask was for us and our team to do it, right? And it's like, hey, our, our focus is on insights and, and getting that aspect of it, right? So I would say that that's probably the, the first barrier. Um, and then the second barrier would really, again, be that technical gap, right? Like we have the technical components of it, but the, the missing of how do we manifest this within an organization? Um, you know, I know I've gotten pushback a lot from some of the team that I manage when we're doing an hour presentation. And I say, you can't have more than 15 slides, including the header. And it's but this is a 75 page A and U that we've done. Like I need to share 50 slides for an hour. I was like, you don't, that's all the data, that's all the report, right? But it's it's a it's like almost anxiety producing. I'm like, but I have all this information, right? And so much of the aha comes from like, that's great. Tell me the three things I need to know from this A and U that you've done. And, and that pushback, right? Of thinking through, where are we on the business? Why is this important now? Why do I care? It might be a great insight, but it might not fit with the BE, right? And that's what we're pushing our managers to do versus presenting 50 slides and then having to turn it over to a marketer and then the marketer has to sit there and say like, well, so what, right? Um, I think that's a big shift that is happening across a lot of insights functions and what they're trying to do. Um, but it, it also ties to how the organization views, right? The, the team and, and how the team is organized within that organization. Yeah, I think you're right. There's definitely, um, and I think it's 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 been a great year to see that kind of difference and, and people who have, who are still out there just kind of collecting data. My job is just to get to the next stage gate and need to get the data out to definitely people who are like, I really want to understand what those drivers are, what the, where the growth is really coming from and conducting research that really looks at that. Um, and when you get those, the kind of the bad news on market research, it's also like, great, thank goodness we didn't move forward with that concept or that new communication because it wasn't going to work. <laughs> and that's also a great reason to do the research and um, 
and uh, yeah, it's always an interesting challenge when you have to go back to a marketer to say your idea might not be the best one to move forward with here. Um, what are your thoughts on democratization of market research across industries? Should it sit within insights teams or should it be democratized? I believe it should be democratized, similar to panel data, right? I, I find it really interesting where, I, and I've worked in organizations like this in the past, right, where the CI functions um, way of not having influence, right, but of, of being able to play in the space is almost withholding information and research as a tactic, right? I am actually the proponent of all this should be free. Like if it's panel data, everyone should have access. There's no need to have a middle person pulling this information, right? If we're all on the same team trying to have planters grow X amount, right? The more data they have, the better. But I would say that the focus is really also on strategic projects that help understand kind of the business as a whole is what the insights team should be working on, right? It's actual projects that any other department tackles. That's how, how we should be looking at it, right? And, and it's not something that is just supporting an org, uh, a work stream of someone else, but actually something that leadership says insights this has to be led by insights because it'll help us unlock growth for A or B reasons. Um, and, and I think that that's the that's the aha holy grail, right? That that you all want to be in. Yeah, for sure. And we're certainly seeing it with um, a number of our clients, those that are bringing new users into the Suzy platform and um, helping us uh, kind of really democratize it across their company and the ones that we can also see succeeding. Um, and there are certainly some companies who will keep it just to that one user, um, where it's market search lives and dies within the one team, which can be damaging, I think, to a, to a company in certain areas. I'd love to kind of, you know, uh, what advice you would have for other insights leaders um, here on the call around um, you know kind of how to stay ahead um, of the tools, how to stay ahead of um, all of the trends that we're seeing. Um, um, just really kind of what advice you would have as, you, as we lean into 2021 together as an industry. I don't know about the credibility of uh, being the one providing the advice on, on moving forward, right? But I guess I can tell you my experience and the approach I've taken a lot of the time. Um, you know, a lot insights, I am all about great getting a presentation, great getting an overview, great understanding all the tools, but I'm also a big camp of try it, break it, repeat it, and, and see if you can make it fit and work, right? So I am a big proponent of pilots. Um, it might not be a lot of money that gets handed to there, um, but it, it allows us to really explore and view ways of, of doing things, right? Um, and always having that conversation, again, willing to move, um, understanding, you know, if someone's like, I know system one is very much in the future forefront of what research is and how we're focusing on, right? What, which vendors are incorporating system one and what do they mean by system one? Same thing with AI, right? I think uh, AI is the new, the new shiny toy that we've, we've, you know, for the 2020s onward, you know, but most people don't understand that. AI has been around technically for 50, 60 years, depending on how you want to define it on big data, right? So working with this vendor and saying, okay, well, what do you mean by AI? How is this different from, from our current tool? Um, but seriously, my, my favorite approach is always trying it, putting something to it, putting a purpose to it. Is it an innovation tool? Is it a comms tool? How do we want to use this tool? And let's vet it out and try it. Um, and many times, you know, we were looking at concept testing, for example, and trying to evaluate a little differently, incorporating system one. What we ended up doing, I was like, guys, I want to pay a pilot for all three give them the same concept. I want to see the output that comes, the timing. So we sent them all three, the exact same brief, the exact same everything to un at the same day, right? To understand how they operated and what would happen. Um, and that's, I, I love that approach, right? And then I usually find people that I'm like, I really want to work with them, this delivers. How do we, how do we expand this? What are their uses? And there's times where it's like, this is not a fit or this is very similar to what we already have, right? A lot of the times it's just market research is not very differentiated in terms of tools or methodologies. So it comes down to to the person you have a relationship with or the vendor you already work with, right, internally. Um, but yeah, try, break, and repeat is, is my favorite approach. Um, it's also the most fun in terms of getting your hands in and, and being able to play with methodologies and, and insights and, and the approach overall. Absolutely love that. Try, break, and repeat. Um, and pilots, you're right. It doesn't have to necessarily be a kind of like all or nothing. You can pilot it. 
Um, we've had to get very creative as a company also this year on how we can work with new companies who do want to try out new features and functions, um, etc. Um, so it's been great for, and often we'll have our product team join those calls so our product team can also understand what to build for the future um, as well. Fantastic. All right, I'm going to open up for questions. So audience, if you're out there, we have a questions function. Um, please feel free to add some questions in um, that you would want to ask to either Pran or myself. I will keep an eye on the chat function um, right now. I don't see any questions coming in at the moment. Ah, the, here we go. Okay, so the frozen food industry has long provided a ghost kitchen to restaurants. Do you see brands like Kraft being more aggressive in this particular space? I mean, I would love to see that, right? We have an entire division that is our fast food service, right? It's now called Away From Home. Um, I'm, as, I'm not familiar with, with that industry as much, right, in, in our organization. Um, but the fact that we have an away from home pillar, right, I, I hope that that's part of what we're looking at and understanding and, and the opportunities to go in there, right, of the food and beverage experience as a whole versus just looking at ourselves as a manufacturer to be resold, right? It, it's almost a frame of reference shift that um, I would hope so is being part of that away from home. Awesome. Um, and the next question um, is related to the impact of the pandemic on the consumer insights function within the company. Do you feel that it's grown in importance in 2020 and do you, continue, do you see it continuing to grow um, in its importance in 21? I do. Um, I, I believe that the biggest questions come, right, but I, you could also argue that it's every year the same thing, right, but why? Why so much of the growth? Why is this happening with COVID? Why did they go to Kraft Mac and Cheese? It was really a nostalgia thing. Like there's just all this behavior shift that happened that one, we weren't expecting, right? No one was expecting COVID reality or anything like that. And then seeing the drastic consumer shift in consumer be in shopper and consumer behavior, you know, throws off a lot of your strategic planning. You're thinking, hey, I have all this data. This is the growth that I'm seeing, you know, groceries were supposed to underperform fast food this year right based on the mintel predictions in january as <laughs> yes, we're looking at, at all the things that were happening so now it's the big focus is why did the behavior change how do we keep the favorability and what behavior is going to stick and not and what's the new normal right so it, it just opens up so many questions that we have in addition to the brand strategy and category management work that was already part of supporting you know billion dollar brands of the day-to-day -day aspect. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and a question regarding panels, I can probably answer. Um, so a major challenge for the country this year has been AI and bots making their way into panel data with panel partners, et cetera. Is this something that everybody's struggling with? So I myself, my background is in uh, panel, the panel industry. Um, at Suzy, we own our own panel. So something that we're doing um, at Suzy is we have just implemented um, a new quality manager, um, but also a lot of companies in the panel space are moving into using AI, um, using companies like Sample Chain, MaxMind, and MixPanel to really identify a lot of those kind of um, behaviors of time of day that panelists are responding, the speed at which they're responding, um, what IP addresses they're coming from, incognito window browsers, and so on. So uh, I think that question came from Zachary Smith. Happy to talk to you um, offline all about kind of panels and, uh, and how they're uh, challenged with uh, with bots etc there another question for you Fran um, what are you doing with uh, transactional data right now and how has that changed this year transactional data in terms of just panel purchase data like how much has been sold or so in terms I'm of assuming so yeah it sounds like that's the context yeah, a lot of it has been trying to cut and dissect it as much as possible in every way, trying to, again, identify blips of growth and, and what, what's happening, right? So a lot of the focus also has been on supply chain components for what we forecast in 2020 and the needs for our products and, and modifying that, right? So a lot of, I would say, half of 2020 has been transactional and figuring out how do we put our ducks in order because of COVID realities. You know, some of those COVID realities are that they are asking for more product than they usually have in the back end before. Um, there's no new innovations going into our customers. Like all these modifications that are happening because of COVID, right, has been very transactional. And the sales has been more of analyze the performance of it, right? 
Um, as you can imagine, it's been growth for, for a manufacturer as a whole. So it's like which brands grew the most, which ones had some declines, and what can we do about it? Um, but yeah, very transactional, very what. It, it's, we're still focusing on what happened really in 2020 outside of just overall growth. Yeah. I think we're all trying to work out what happened this year. <laughs> um, a really fun question for you. So um, Christopher Fay asks, you've worked across a number of great categories and businesses. What's been the most surprising research finding that you've come across in your career? And where did that lead you? I would say that, and it was probably my, my favorite experience too, um, was I was um, over the Hispanic portfolio when I was at Dr. Pepper Snapple Group. Um, and part of my favorite research actually that we did was really is the first time that the market was really doing bicultural Spanish research um, that was happening in, in, in the space as you know, given the growth of, of the segment and the opportunity that was there. Um, and basically, if you guys don't know Clamato, it's the equivalent of the tomato juice that you use for, for Bloody Marys. In Spanish, they're called micheladas, right? But it's the, the exact same thing. Um, and having to do a lot of this qualitative research, where we ended up, right, finding the territory and the space where, where we heard people saying that Clamato is, in Spanish, there's no English word for it, right, but they called it convivio, which means to co-live with someone. But it's when you go to someone's house on Sunday and there's no party or anything, but it's just a friend that you see on a regular basis, Clamato plays a role there. Um, it's, you know, you're going to go see your mom on a Tuesday after dinner or whatever, like Clamato plays a role there. So finding this territory that, you know, you have to go back and say, how do I translate this Spanish insight narrative to a room that, who doesn't, that doesn't speak Spanish, is trying to learn the Spanish market and advance this so that it is the, the territory that we move from, right, to, that we action against. Um, so it was not only finding that insight, but being able to influence the organization, you know, as an associate manager and showing them that, yeah, this is the territory that we should go down because the insight in itself it is so core and rooted, but it's a gamble when you can't even translate that to, to English, right, of what it means other than co-living. Um, but it was one of, I, I think that's probably up there in terms of my favorite project, just because of the actual insights work um, of the AHA. Yeah, that's awesome. We've got some really fantastic questions coming through. Thank you, everybody, for these. Um, one question, what role, if any, has package, packaging design played in this kind of shift towards grazing um, instead of snacking and being at home? I, I, I don't know if it's, it's the packaging that's played a role. I, I think it's been the consumer behavior and companies catching up. Um, I would say that there are some amazing case studies that I, I've even studied just out of uh, how awesome I feel it is, right, but that have leveraged packaging to increase consumption. Um, and the one that comes to mind is very much Hershey's, right, M&M and, and the entire, the bigger bag. Um, and the bigger insight there, uh, the bigger aha is that consumers are buying more, but people are interested in just having one or two. So they actually think that they're going to eat less when, when they have the bag at home. What ends up happening is they eat the same amount and finish the entire bag and that consumption goes up, right? So that packaging innovation has almost been like that is increasing the occasion based on an insight that people say they don't want to eat more and they, they trust themselves in saying that they're not going to get more than four M&Ms per trip and they end up getting the handful, which is more than the little bag that you would typically buy. Um, outside of that, though, I would feel, I, I figure that a lot of packaging work is catching up to, to the occasions um, that we have. And then smaller brands are, are are able to you know behave now and, and act now based on the needs, so they're able to package however is most suitable for them. Yeah, that's great. I definitely suffer from that M and M. I'll just buy the multi pack so I eat less, and then eat like twelve multi packs, <laughs> so a desk full of M and M packets. Um, another great question. So with so much work, so much stress, so much to navigate and accomplish in the busy working day in twenty twenty. How do you focus on what's important? And outside of research, where do you turn each day for inspiration? Yeah, so um, in terms of getting to uh, what focus on, right? I would say that it's really coming down to working and, and understanding the business objectives of the organization. And that sounds so, so cliche aspect of it, right? But 
I can argue that many of the times the work that CI work is doing doesn't even know what it ladders up to in terms of this. The company has said that these are going to be our growth platforms and this is what we're going to focus on. This is the objective for the priority brands of the company, right? So being able to, to streamline our work and knowing, you know, these are the three things we want to accomplish this year. And as you lay out your learning plan, right? I was like, how does this learning plan tie to the three things we said we were going to accomplish this year, right? And that's already a lot for a major brand, but there's that usually that disconnect um, at the end of the day, right? In terms of inspiration, like I mentioned, one of my biggest things is um, having the business lens of what we do and trying to get to that strategic business partner. I've actually been obsessed right now with a podcast called Business Wars, and it's really awesome what it does. It actually it gives you the history of two competitors, how they came to be, kind of some of the situations. So it's like Nike versus Reebok, um, McDonald's versus Burger King, right? And and how they came to be, financing issues, corporate restrategy. So it's almost like a, a podcast that you're following for eight episodes, right? But it's on two competitive brands. Um, Netflix versus HBO is what I just finished, which was awesome. And it gives you that mindset of growth. How do you retain customers? How do you have a product? Like the things that you need to think about because we are at the end of the day manufacturers. And I think a lot of people don't even understand that frame of reference for Kraft Heinz, right? We manufacture products that get resold. That is our business model. Um, so having that frame of work and how other companies and cross industries, you know, you could learn a lot. And, and I love that just different mindset. And then how do you apply it to our business model? Amazing. And it's a podcast called Business Wars. Um, I really love how I made this, but I'm excited to dive into uh, Business Wars. I'll definitely get to that one. So final question. It's a nice and easy one. <laughs> is Where do you see consumer behavior in three years from now? I I don't know. I think my biggest my biggest thing is going to be on what is this new reality of like work life work like the nine to five is out the door. I am confident of that. Like I there's going to still be industries that require it, that, but that's going to be almost an antiquated model, right? Like this has proven that if your company is forcing you to go in from nine to five, it's it's not with the times or or, or understanding kind of the reality of what life is in, in 2021 onwards. How that manifests itself is going to be, I think, the big distinction of, of what the behavior looks like. So I, I don't know, and I don't have, I don't even have a bet, but I would assume that we're going into a hybrid model at minimum for the next five years of some office space, some at home space. And it's the, the consumption is really going to be on, on those occasions if you're at home or out of home based on the reality that you're at. But I think that's going to dictate so much of what this looks like of what's the requirement for working um, because we all have to do it to pay bills. <laughs> so. Great. Yeah. So really keep a focus on the future of work and the office environment as it would pertain to, to CPG and food and drink. Awesome. Thank you so much, Fran. This has been absolutely wonderful. Always great to chat to you. I'm going to hand back to the uh, Quirks team now to say a farewell, but thank you so much to uh, everybody that joined and thank you for the fantastic questions. This has been an awesome end to the year. I'll hand back to Quirks at this moment. Yeah, sounds great. Thank you so much. Yeah, those were some tremendous questions. I appreciate those from the audience. And I'd like to thank Fran and Katie and everybody at Suzy, and most importantly, all of you out there for taking time out of your schedules to be with us here today. We really appreciate it. So thanks again and have a good day. Thanks, y'all.